Welcome and thank you for joining us today for how DevOps and continuous delivery are redefining application delivery in the enterprise. Five key success factors and outcomes. My name is Raleigh Gould and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Our featured speakers are Julie Craig, Research Director at Enterprise Management Associates, and Rod Gidron, Product Marketing Director at Atomic Software. Julie has over 20 years of experience in software engineering, IT infrastructure engineering, and enterprise management. At EMA, Julie's focus areas include DevOps, application performance and availability management, as well as application discovery and dependency mapping. Ron has spent the last 14 years in product marketing, product management, and pre-sales positions in both startups and large enterprises. His passion lies in the intersection of software, users, and market trends. And before I hand things over to today's featured speakers, I did want today's audience to know that Julie and Ron will be dedicating the last 10 minutes or so of today's event to answering your questions. So I do encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. You can log your questions at any time throughout the course of the presentation by using the Q&A functionality. Also, today's event is being recorded, and you will receive a follow-up email from Enterprise Management Associates that will include the playback as well as a PDF of the slides. So be on the lookout for that email. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our first featured speaker, Julie Craig. Julie? Raleigh, uh, thank you so much. And to uh, everybody on the call, welcome to today's event. So Raleigh, up oh, there it goes having a little trouble there getting that first uh, slide to advance. So as software delivery uh, becomes increasingly synonymous with revenue growth, organizations are seeking newer, faster ways to deliver applications to the enterprise. DevOps and continuous delivery are part of an industry trans transformation aimed at facilitating this process. I'll take some time today to discuss these two topics and talk a bit about how they relate to one another. I'm also going to talk about the impact they have on the businesses that adopt them. I'll discuss five key findings from my research on DevOps and continuous delivery to illustrate some of the most important factors impacting IT's ability to execute on these initiatives. Hopefully, today's discussion will be helpful for IT organizations to keep in mind as they continue to evolve their continuous delivery strategies. So DevOps and continuous delivery are two of those terms that are used very differently by different vendors, by different analysts and IT organizations. Enterprise Management Associates uses the terms to describe broad concepts versus specific products. DevOps typically has an enterprise connotation. In other words, it's probably more relevant to businesses than to software vendors creating applications for uh, the broader market. That being said, modern application ecosystems are so complex that most organizations are finding that they need collaborative processes and cross-functional teams to support them. DevOps practices facilitate collaboration, and from the EMA perspective, they do this across the life cycle. While DevOps discussions often center only around the deploy release stage of the life cycle, I believe it can be useful to broaden the discussion to include multiple stages. With a life cycle approach, each stage becomes an iterative cycle of its own since this is the reality within most development and operations organizations. For example, software design tends to involve iteratively with input from the business stakeholders over time. Code is also developed in iterations since testing can send a given piece of code back through the development process. And even production support shown as the managed stage in this graphic has its iterations. Applications are continually monitored and sent back through the life cycle for bug fixes and modifications. 
Each time changes occur, software must be redeployed, typically either to test environments or to production environments. And each stage requires, to some degree, conversations and collaborations across development, operations, and business stakeholders. As you can see here, cross-functional teams, teams doing those sorts of cross-functional activities that I talked about, do exist within almost every company. Most of the people on these teams are actually senior professionals who are knowledgeable in a number of key technology areas. That being said, you'll rarely find the DevOps name attached to a group in, in, in most companies. More often, they're called names like application management, infrastructure services, or they have some other name that's meaningful to their given company. And on a final note on this, almost 75% of the time, these are dedicated versus ad hoc teams. So while the name may not be attached, the function itself does exist in most companies. In contrast to DevOps, which focuses on people uh, and collaboration, continuous delivery is more process and deliverable oriented. The term focuses on accelerated delivery of software, usually in small increments. I'm talking to some companies today who are delivering uh, software in increments uh, multiple times daily, actually. And while DevOps applies more to enterprises than software vendors, continuous delivery actually applies to both. For vendors, the target for continuous delivery is likely a version or release package, which will later be delivered to customers. In the enterprise, the ultimate target is usually production. However, regardless of the target, both software companies and IT organizations are finding <clears throat> that release automation is becoming increasingly critical. It actually helps them maintain the consistency of software packages as the software moves across the life cycle. When you look at the software lifecycle in context to continuous delivery, the need for release automation becomes increasingly apparent. A robust, well-governed lifecycle builds a firm foundation for continuous delivery. However, the iterative nature of today's application delivery practices means that application code, with all of its associated artifacts, is being deployed more often both within the stages and across the stages. It's also being deployed to a, an increasing number of targets, such as virtualized environments. From this perspective, a strong lifecycle focus becomes the ideal backbone for delivering software in virtually any type of organization. That's because the reality of continuous delivery is this. Delivery cannot be truly accelerated unless every stage of the underlying life cycle is also accelerated. And it's also true that acceleration alone is not enough. It's equally important to deliver software as written and as tested with 100% accuracy, regardless of the target and across multiple stages. So when you think about the manual processes that many companies are using <coughs> for, uh, for software deployment and releases, you start to begin to realize that these processes alone aren't enough to achieve the level of consistency necessary for deployment in high-velocity environments. That's why automation of these processes is becoming so critical. So why DevOps and continuous delivery? Are they really worth the effort? Well, my research indicates that they are uh, and that they actually have an impact on revenue growth. So this slide is very busy, I realize, but I'll walk you through it to kind of convey what I'm trying to say here. It compares <clears throat> the findings from my research on revenue growth with the quality of the DevOps interactions within a, a given company. The blue bars 
show companies whose revenue increased by double digits in the prior 12 months. The green bar shows companies whose revenue decreased, remained flat, or increased by single digits. On the y-axis on the left side of the chart, we grouped companies into two categories. Those who rank the interactions between their Dev and Ops groups as excellent or above are shown in the top set of green and blue bars. Those whose DevOps interactions were average or below are shown in the bottom set of bars. Now, multiple conclusions can be drawn here, and I probably could have done my whole uh, part of this presentation just from this slide and the next one. But one of the most interesting things here to me is that 87% of companies reporting efficient, high-quality DevOps interactions saw double-digit revenue growth in the prior year. 66% of the same group saw less stellar revenue, and the delta between them is 21%. So while it's possible to achieve good revenue growth without good DevOps interactions, it's far more likely that you're going to do so if you do have Dev and Ops working well together. In contrast, when you look at the bottom bars, only 13% of those reporting average or poorer interactions reported higher growth revenue. <clears throat> so while high-quality DevOps practices don't guarantee revenue growth, they can make a dramatic difference. So on the next slide, uh, in another validation <clears throat> of the need for speed, this slide focuses on delivery frequency, so the relationship between delivery frequency and revenue. The color code is the same as we saw on the previous slide with the blue bars showing uh, revenue increases in the double digits and the green bars showing relatively flat revenue. However, the left side of this chart groups companies by, their incre by the increases in percentages of their frequency of code delivery. So on the top tier, we see that companies which increased delivery frequency by 10% or more in the prior year were more than 35% more likely to see double-digit revenue increases. The bottom tier is equally noteworthy. 75% of the companies who accelerated software delivery uh, by 10% or less tended to see more relatively flat or decreased revenue. Taking into account the data on this slide and the prior one, it becomes clear that IT has become an important driver for business revenue versus the cost center that it was often perceived as in the past. It also becomes apparent that both DevOps and continuous delivery, when well executed, can deliver impressive business value, not simply uh, additional IT efficiency, which it can also do. So with that introduction, what are some of the factors driving DevOps and continuous delivery and some of the factors that are inhibiting, inhibiting their adoption. The first important takeaway revealed by the research is that business-related factors, not technology-related factors, are driving this acceleration. In fact, the top four drivers are business and customer-generated. <clears throat> Business leaders are demanding new products and services that enable them to better compete in their industries. Customers are making their voices heard with their pocketbooks. High-quality software can be a differentiator that encourages them to, pur to purchase from one vendor versus, versus another. I know I um, notice vi very often uh, on online purchases that some vendors are easy to deal with, some vendors are difficult to deal with, and I definitely tend to trend towards those that I can uh, or order something in one click or two. So software really makes a difference here. This accelerated delivery has now become the norm for many companies who are seeking ways to make the process more seamless and predictable, because that's the key. 
And moving towards continuous delivery, everything isn't all uh, wine and roses. It's also important to be aware that the process has its pitfalls. The first is that it can be very difficult to ramp up delivery speed to a point that satisfies the business. It's not simply a matter of working faster because most of us are already working as fast as we can. It's also a matter of working smarter, often by investing in tools which can help facilitate the process because both DevOps and continuous delivery are two processes that can be dramatically improved with the right automation. It's also important to note that acceleration of the process can also impact quality to the point where production environments can be adversely impacted. So this is another negative side of continuous delivery. In fact, adverse production impact appears to be a very significant pitfall. Survey respondents say development and operations are drawn into production support more often and that performance and availability problems are on the increase. There are multiple reasons for this, uh, and they aren't always code-related. High rates of change are well-known causes of production issues, as uh, any of you who work within IT organizations uh, have known probably since you started working there. Uh, and one of the additional problems here is that because of the fact that software is being accelerated in uh, being released into production, testing is often short-changed. So we're uh, releasing software faster. It's often not tested as well as it might be. And, um, you know, a lot of the automated processes we're doing along the way tend to increase uh, the potential for error. Taking this idea a step further and looking at the impact of continuous delivery on development, you see that development teams are increasingly spending time on production support versus writing code. So when you think back to the earlier slides in my presentation where I drew a parallel between velocity of code delivery and revenue, it becomes clear that you really want your developers writing code and you don't want them bogged down in production support. Uh, this is doubly true because while some production errors are definitely code related, they're equally likely to be related to errors in how the, co the code is deployed. Are all servers and operating systems and middleware configured according to spec and at the correct level? Were all application related artifacts deployed or did deployment fail for certain portions of the code package? If you can get these sorts of things right, that's that much less time that development has to spend in helping troubleshoot production environments. I recently spoke with the director of engineering who described a, a deployment where failure to populate a single table in a software release led to customers being unable to utilize personal electronics devices. Now, that's the kind of thing that probably has happened to everybody as a result of software re release, but maybe didn't impact quite so many people. Um, so if we can solve those kinds of problems, we can get rid of a lot of the issues related to continuous delivery. And time developers spend on production support is time not spent on developing new software. So. Hopefully, with automation, companies can get to the point where that's not as much a factor. This slide shows the top wish list tools of IT professionals involved in production support. It's interesting to me to note that they now include products supporting continuous delivery on their tools wish list. Software integration testing tools top the list. However, automating the continuous delivery work stream comes in as a close second. Leading edge companies are automating the entire end-to-end -end pro process. So they're automating the testing process along with the deployment process and even integrating 
test runs into deployment automation work stream. So if the software passes all the tests, it's automatically deployed into production. Now, although this is a very risky process, and I certainly uh, would not recommend this unless you're prepared to sort of deal with the fallout, I do believe it's the direction in which leading edge companies seem to be going, and it's probably uh, going to become more popular, particularly as companies can continue to invest uh, in automation that can um, make the process more predictable. So um, to summarize my portion of, the pre of today's presentation, um, for all the reasons I've described here, software delivers unique and significant business value. Business and IT have become even more intertwined as software becomes an increasingly important foundation for business growth. However, accelerating velocity of software delivery is key uh, to making this happen. Um, but as I noted, it also brings its own challenges. Automation focused on lifecycle management, on testing, and on release automation can mitigate these challenges to help ensure positive continuous delivery outcomes. So that concludes um, my portion of uh, today's presentation. And with that, I would like to turn uh, the mic over to Ron Gidron, who's going to tell you a little bit more about Atomic. Ron? Thank you, Julie. And thanks, everyone, for uh, attending today. So um, at Atomic, we have been working in automation for over 25 years across a very broad spectrum of things. And, in, and particularly in the last five years, we've been working with a lot of large large customers and new customers of ours on the DevOps and, and continuous delivery automation. <laughs> and we, we noticed some, some very interesting observations on what's driving if in the in the enterprise environment, what's driving the, the dev and the upsides of DevOps and, and um, we developed a, 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 a unique point of view on some of the intricacies of how uh, enterprises go about um, uh, transitioning to DevOps so that they can reap the benefits, the business benefits of going faster. So what I'd like to do in the next um, 20 minutes or 25 minutes or so is to share that point of view with, with everyone um, and bring up some of the some of the points that uh, that we've noticed and then I'll, I'll conclude with a, with a short demo. Um, really, what I'm what I'm about to uh, to try and, and illustrate for you is that there is a a uh, mapping process that needs to happen in an enterprise environment for the existing applications um, to understand how to trans transition them how to how to transition different applications into a DevOps process so that the business benefits that were described can be can be matched. So I'm going to start with a little bit of familiar familiar history. I think uh, for anyone that's been on on a on a DevOps page or talk in the past years, I'm sure I'm sure you're pretty familiar. Um, so DevOps really started uh, well, almost 15 years ago in in development. Um, you know, the, the Agile Manifesto showed, showed up first time. You can see it on the left in, in 2001. This is, you know, um, grassroots developers, you know, bringing out a, a new philosophy. Um, today, you know, we, we, we like to talk about the differences between DevOps and Waterfall and what it means in terms of development. But really, at the essence, you know, uh, these developers are saying we, we appreciate processing tools and we appreciate comprehensive documentation and, and following a plan, but we appreciate more, you know, the need to respond to change and customer collaboration and individuals and interactions and all of those things. And, and really the reason behind this, I think, I, I think it's, it's fair to say is um, software development was just too slow. And for those of you that have been in the industry long enough, I'm sure you remember, projects, you know, regularly over, overshooting dates by years sometimes or, or, or even more, you know, some big government stories of, of, of a past decade. Um, and it takes the next couple of years till about 2008 when the first um, tools 
to actually implement uh, some of these, to help facilitate some of these agile methodologies, show up on the scene. The Hudson Continuous Integration Server, uh, Hudson was the original uh, project, for those of you that, have, that are Jenkins, is one of the most uh, uh, familiar uh, continuous integration servers in the development world today. Hudson was actually the original project name. It was, uh, I believe it was developed as, a, as an open source under Sun Microsystems and then when Oracle uh, took it over and split into Jenkins, which stayed with open source and uh, Oracle as far as I know still, still on uh, the Hudson continuous integration server. But, you know, it's only about 2008, so roughly six or seven years ago, that a lot of development projects are actually starting to run uh, continuous integration and, and, and delivering, you know, continuous flow of software. Um, if you look at um, what's happening right about um, in right about 2011, I think the infrastructure and maintenance become a bottleneck. So from 2008 to roughly about 2012, software development starts speeding up really quickly. So development teams are, are spewing out, so to speak, a lot of a lot of software in a much faster pace, but the infrastructure delivery becomes a bottleneck. So uh, you can see, you know, back in, in 2012, more than 65% of, and this across across all industries, more than 65% of servers are still physical only. So it takes a lot of time. To just get a server to, to just get a server and install it in a data center and, and configure it. The, the point, my point is, if software development was a bottleneck in, in, you know, in 2000 and between 2001 and 2008, then between 2008 and 2012, which is really quite recent, the, um, the, the, the data center management, uh, the operations became, um, the, you know, became a, bo a bottleneck. And so, uh, as a response to that, in about those times, um, a lot of uh, um, tools for um, uh, both virtualization and infrastructure as code, uh, tools like these uh, start showing up on the scene, enabling the, the delivery of, uh, of, of um, software much, much faster. A lot of these uh, software tools that are very popular today, I mean, um, um, both Chef and Puppet are, are, are you know, household names almost in our industry. So Saltstack and Ansible, they're, they're all uh, have become uh, synonymous with uh, configuring servers on the fly, managing data centers as code, etc. And um, the interesting thing about many of these tools is they were developed uh, mostly as open source projects out of um, internet. Uh, unicorn companies, companies like Google, companies like Facebook, that um, are building uh, applications and infrastructures to roll out really, really quickly. Um, and so enterprises are starting to take notice, and they want to go, and they want to do the same thing because, you know, the business reasons that Julie just showed us. But when you look at an enterprise application, you know, the enterprise environment has systems thinking embedded into it. There is a lot of um, complexity and a lot of integration, a lot of legacy that enterprises have to, to deal with, and still um, isolated groups within the enterprise are embarking on this change. So DevOps is kind of, in the enterprise environment, is, is, is stirring up in different parts of an organization. And as we could see in all of this, we're still feeling today, there is an increase in, in um in production uh, outages and, and, and changes. So what we're seeing, we're seeing uh, enterprises, you know, trying to go much faster, adopting some processes and going much faster, but then uh, losing control in a sense. Um, and so we want to try and, and take a look at that and understand uh, where, why that's happening and maybe provide some sort of a framework for enterprises as an automation company for how to go about um, adopting DevOps systematically for your enterprise application uh, one by one. So to do that, I'd like to um, um, take, a, take a step back and, and share that point of view that I was talking about earlier. So as we, as we most know, if you look at um, the complexity of data centers from you know, the early 70s in the mainframe to, you know, a little bit into the future, internet of things and big data. Uh, this is uh, 
probably a, you know a, a known fact now the complexity just continues to rise it, you know the, the number of connected devices connected machines within the data center or out, outside of the data centers are just uh, exponentially growing up and that complexity is increasingly hard to manage from a from a data center operations perspective uh, whether you think about um, just you know security or even just you know making things work networking and, and implementing and, and also um, uh, delivering applications to very large infrastructures and, and handling a lot of um, scalability uh, factors that you know didn't uh, need to be taken into account maybe a few years back. And of course, we all know that the pressures to go faster from a business perspective, from a customer perspective, are going the other way around. So in the gap between those, that rising complexity and the pressure uh, to go faster, this in this gap right between the blue and the, the blue line and the red um, stripes, uh, you know, going opposite directions. If you look at the gap that's opening up on the on the right hand side, this is where organizations lose. Um, control and sometimes, you know, um, that has uh, implications in terms of downtime, maybe to a, to a critical business application, sometimes to an entire company. Um, and we, you know, so we we try and look at that uh, same history and and understand, you know, if you look at again, at, if you look at this graph and you look at the context of application development over. Uh, over time, really, and on um, on the left hand side, the, the, the y axis here is for complexity of the application development itself. Then you can see roughly around you know 2008 or so that uh, waterfall for you know methodology and big projects becomes a, a big big bottleneck, and so and this maps right about with the times that I showed you before how you know agile tools and tool chains. Agile methodologies take place, and tool chains that support it start um, uh, flourishing. And over, and you know, application development. This is not to say that you know algorithms have become uh, easier or or so, but this is to say that um, com uh, uh, comprising the system, developing applications, is becoming um, easier to roll out because of these, uh, because of a lot of advancements in tools. And so over time, the application development stops being a bottleneck. And if you look at the infrastructure um, delivery, we talked about the physical infrastructure and the virtualization, you'll, you'll notice that it's really, you know, over time follows that. So if the, if the peak of, of bottleneck for the dev was somewhere around, you know, 2008 or so, the peak for, of, of bottleneck for the infrastructure team and for data centers or operations teams followed just a little bit later at around, you know, probably 2011. So, the, so these are the days where you know development delivers the software, but we're waiting for the servers to be installed for another three months. So these these are also the days where you know virtualization technology, VMware, a lot of a lot of other virtualization there is becoming a lot more mainstream, as well as infrastructure as code tools that are you know uh, appearing to start helping. Today, you know we are in a situation where both uh, the application, as well as so the application development happening pretty fast, and the infrastructure can be readily available and you know start a virtual machine uh, in, a, in a few minutes or even a cluster of, thereof, and configured with uh, with everything with with all of the bases. But what we're seeing that's very interesting is that the deployment process for software follows a very different pattern, and, and, and the deployment process these are. These are the processes that organizations have um, developed with the software for uh, increasingly um, uh, increasing amounts of time, depending on the complexity of, a, of, an, of the application. Uh, for example, it's not uh, it's not rare to see you know a 40-page long manual for the deployment of a billing application at, at large telcos or some banks have them. So, some of our enterprise applications are you know, very complex to deploy and changing them takes, you know, takes intricate knowledge of, of the application and infrastructure and everything. So if you look at the deployment processes, you'll notice that as they were, they were pretty straight, you know, the, the deployment was never simple, but it was pretty, uh, it was plateauing. And then when, when the applications um, sort of uh, uh, 
grew in terms of waterfalls and chunks and big monolithic applications of the of the previous decade came up, you could actually see deployment processes were a little bit less important and they kind of plateaued. But as the uh, applications changed their form and became a lot more distributed, together with the infrastructure, we're seeing an, um, an increase and you know, obviously a lot of um, a lot of integration is happening, a lot of uh, cross-application, um, business process re-engineering is causing, you know, changes many times in remote systems to be, you know, dependent on, on other systems. We're seeing this increase in the, um, the, the, the complexity of the deployment process itself over time. And so it's, it's interesting to see that we have, it's almost like we took care of development. As you know, as a uh, as an industry, an IT industry, we took care of development. We improved on it. We built the tools. We built the methodologies. We're continuously improving. We took we we took care, so to speak, of operations and infrastructure from a and data center infrastructure management. Again, with both um, tools and processes in the data center to you know deliver machines much faster. But the Bottleneck, so to speak, is now becoming the actual process, and this is where, and Julie alluded to, a lot of developers spending more time on um, on deployment, bulk down. So the processes are becoming the processes themselves are becoming a bottleneck, and many organizations understand that they need to change processes. But next, I want to talk a little, and of course, the delivery time expectations that uh, which we forget for those applications continues to drop because um, you know in today's world, today's pressure. To be, the need to go faster, you know, has gone away, and that's accelerating too. So clearly, we need to do something about those uh, deployment and release processes themselves. And the question is, that is there a one size fit all for you know? So can an organization that's maybe a bank or an airline or or, or a telco or any any large enterprise just decide we are going DevOps for what it means? And set a standard, you know, we're going to use, um, I'm just going to pick one, we're going to use Chef to do all, everything, all of our uh, deployments. And, we're, um, and clearly the answer, the answer is no. And, and so now the next question becomes how, uh, you know, how do we as an organization um, uh, estimate and analyze our different application portfolios, uh, list down the processes that we have for deployment across those, and make a decision on how to evolve systematically all our applications uh, one by one until we come to a, to a stage where, you know, as, a, as, as an organization, as, a, as an IT organization, we can really say that we have moved uh, the needle on, on DevOps, uh, clearly with a focus on these processes themselves. And so um, from a business perspective, it's interesting. It's that the fire hose kind of changed. It was on development when they were too slow, and it was on the data center people when, the, when we were waiting for servers. But from a business perspective, the fire hose is still on 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 enterprise IT. And while it's not a huge number of organizations that have DevOps teams, we are, and I, I've definitely come across more and more um, DevOps teams and organizations. And I and I feel uh, personally that that the fire hose is now sort of on these DevOps teams, on these developers and operations uh, at customer sites at, at your, that are working together to do something. And uh, we believe at Atomic that uh, paying close attention to these processes that, that we just described and systematically mapping them um, and deciding how you evolve them is key to making this uh, DevOps transformation journey successful. So we developed this... Um, uh, uh, matrix definition. We, we believe that there is basically three alternatives. So you, you list your applications, and you've got three different alternatives for what you're going to do with these applications. Some applications are just so um, dated, and the processes around them are so dated that maybe you just want to rewrite them completely. You know, maybe might not be the biggest uh, chunk of applications in our portfolio, but for some applications, it's definitely worth the consideration. Um, then, you know, there is the other alternative is attempting to codify the deployment of 
uh, of your application with a with an infrastructure um, of code with a with a with a uh, um, infrastructure of code solution such as Puppet or or, or Chef. And, and we do see a lot of applications, a lot of uh, especially development groups um, uh, going down that route, especially in development, you know, codifying the application deployment as part. And, you know, there's certainly places where sometimes, you know, that is the right way to go, depending on the uh, complexity and, and, and uh, um, so to speak, the uh, interdependencies around that application. Um, and the, and the third option, and this is where, uh, where Atomic uh, specializes and where we um, uh, provide solutions, is to automate existing processes. Um, so use automation as a, um, as a change agent for a process. So when you automate uh, a process from, from end to end, um, sometimes, although the process itself hasn't changed, that 40 page manual, so to speak, you know, you may not need to change it, but, but what you do change is you change the way that it works. So you, once you automate it, it becomes uh, much less of a, um, of a bottleneck, of course, for once, because it's much faster, but second, and, and that speed, um, and, and, and for, for two, because it's a lot more reliable, because the automation, you know, automation doesn't forget a file like people sometimes do, and, and all those human error factors are taken out. Um, so that's the second. The third is also because once that speed and reliability is there, you can actually test more um, because simply because you have more time. Uh, your, your applications are there. So, so there are three alternatives to what you're going to do with these applications. And we think that it, it, it boils down to, to essentially having a, a, a simple matrix that per application you can um, kind of consider the time, investment, resources, how much distraction to the business, the ongoing business is going to happen um, from a technical perspective, from a business perspective, what are the risks that are associated with it and how practical it is. For example, rewriting an application sometimes makes it maybe completely not, you know, not practical, so that option goes out the window. Uh, codifying or, or completely attempting to um, uh, write the, the, the recipes um, in chef to do that a deployment, you know, how practical is it? You know, sometimes it's practical. Sometimes, you know, there are the, the dependencies between the different tiers of the application and the, and the, the, and the dependencies on, on the order of things and, and, and that call for orchestration and it might not be some, some practical. And then you think of the risks uh, that are associated with it. So what are the risks of, you know, uh, codifying something versus automating it versus um, you know, rewriting the application and, and so on and so forth. And with that matrix, you can then systematically um, um, decide how you're going to go about uh, each and every one of your applications. At Atomic, we are a big believer in automation, especially for the enterprise applications. Um, that's what we go to market with. That's uh, how we see a lot of the success with our existing customers uh, that have you know, automated some very complex processes um, for very large interconnected um, applications that span anywhere from you know, modern web, Java or .NET or what have you, based applications all the way to very large back-end enterprise applications such as you know, CRM systems, even like even even the likes of a, of a Siebel or uh, a mainframe. So I'm going to. Um, Quickly run a demo and leave, uh, hopefully still leave uh, in time for, for the Q&A session. Um, in this demo, I chose, and I'm, I'm, I chose to show you a, um, a demonstration of a, um, an application. This is a demo application based on, it's, it's the, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Pip Store application in Java, this is the same sort of an application but with a twist. The back end is actually a mainframe. So, and the idea behind this demonstration is to show that you can actually, using automation, cover use cases that span, um, you know, all the way from the web to the mainframe. So, this is uh, our release automation software. Um, it has packages, which are versions, like Julie, uh, like Julie was saying before. And what we're going to do is we're going to take version number four, and which you know was came from the build and 
Um, so, by the way, it came from the Bill Means Jenkins, uh, you know, created a package, and in Atomic, we are, you know, uh, we get that package. It's automatically integrated, and so now we are moving or transitioning that version into the QA environment, and you can see that, um, you know, it's it's running uh, a SQL Server database uh, actions for that tier, and it's also doing some... Um, uh, Tomcat on the mainframe action, stopping that Tomcat on the mainframe. And uh, third but not last, it's exporting some um, COBOL numbers from uh, from Subversion, from the development side, and uh, going to run that to the mainframe. The, the reason I'm showing you the reports is that uh, you'll be able to actually see the, uh, the JCL, for those of you that know, this is actually mainframe code. And again, the point of this is to show that, you know, from a single workflow, you can orchestrate a front-end, back-end system. And in an environment where uh, you have a large enterprise application that connects different pieces, it doesn't have to be a mainframe. Sometimes it would be an, an Oracle EBS or an SAP or, or a SIBO or any one of those. Um, and codifying, you know, doesn't cover the, the pieces, rewriting is impractical, and you, and you find automation to be, you know, the, the suitable candidate, it can actually be done um, across all those tiers with automation. Um, again, here showing some, some mainframe code uh, that's, that's, that's coming out um, of the mainframe with, with the COBOL uh, part. You can see in our solution, you can monitor uh, you know, workflows, and, and typically we don't, you know, you don't obviously run, uh, some of our customers, you know, have hundreds and hundreds of these processes running uh, concurrently um, every day. We have a large, uh, a large online uh, customer that's doing 80 deployments a day to their, to their backend systems, um, a process that was, uh, that was, had 33 different steps in it and was completely, you know, uh, out of which I, I believe the order of 28 were manual is now completely, um, completely automated, making, uh, you know, a deployment become a trivial, a tri a trivial um, activity. Um, these uh, deployments that you're seeing here, um, right now I'm running them uh, through the UI, um, but they don't have to be. Uh, run through the UI. Um, the platform allows you to model and um, and and create deployment processes for all your applications, very complex applications. And then once that model and processes are in place, um, uh, the packages and everything can be scheduled automatically. Um, so you can actually have a continuous delivery chain that runs all the way from your Jenkins or Team Foundation server or whatever um, uh, continuous integration system you have in development through to the QA stages where we will not only orchestrate the, the application deployment and put it on the system, but we'll actually also orchestrate the, run, the execution of tests, automated tests, be they, you know, whether you're using Selenium or HP or any one of those, these test runs could also be part of the orchestration process that you're seeing here. Of course, with integration of those test results back and then from there to your, you know, integration environment and all the way to production. So you can actually build a, a continuous delivery um, system for even legacy applications like the one um, that, I'm, that I'm showing here. Um, so with that, I... Um, would like to thank you. I think we have just about uh, 10 minutes left for questions. Raleigh, I'm going to pass the ball on to you, and um, I'm ready for questions. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Ron. Yes, if you have any questions, you can log them now using the Q&A functionality. Ron, let's start with you. The first question is, we have an application which is already partially automated using Chef and we are still doing parts of the migrations manually due to challenges with timing. What would you recommend? I'm sorry, Rally, I, I could barely hear you. Could you repeat the question for me? Sure. The question is, we have an application which is already partially automated using Chef, and we are still doing parts of the migrations manually due to challenges with timing. What would you recommend? Oh, so that's that's a great question, and I I um, 
So one of the intricacies of uh, uh, deployment in an enterprise environment is that sometimes uh, with Chef or Puppet for, for that matter or any, any other one of these tools, um, there's a need for orchestration of Chef itself. So the, the, I'm assuming that the, that the question of challenges with timing have to do with the, the, the fact that many of the infrastructure as code tools, they are built to um, ensure ensure uh, consistency. So, so in a chef or a puppet, you, you essentially describe the, 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 the end state that you'd like your systems to be. So, for example, I want there to be a MySQL server or that, that version and these directories and so on and so forth. And the infrastructure is called tool, be it a chef or a puppet, handles that. When you try and, and, and uh, codify uh, application deployment, the uh, importance of order in terms of steps of how you do it becomes uh, much more critical. So, for example, you have to stop the database before you update a, a web service. So those are the challenges. And, and the only way to, to handle that with infrastructure tools is inserting wait statements. I'm assuming that's where the question comes from. And so we have seen uh, more than a number of customers that have actually used uh, and we've built an integration from our orchestration uh, solution, from our automation platform, to orchestrate the, the, the chef workflows themselves. So you can actually enjoy uh, both worlds. So I guess the short answer is, is uh, what I would recommend is I would recommend that you look at how you would orchestrate um, the, those parts that are uh, problematic from a timing perspective with chef. And uh, we provide a great integration with uh, any one of the tools that were uh, presented here and many more. So we'd be happy to talk about it. Great. Thank you, Ron. Now, Julie, let's jump over to you. This question is, you mentioned that products supporting a start-to-finish continuous delivery work stream are a top wish list category. What types of products would be included in this description? Well, that's a very interesting question. And it's interesting to me uh, because it, it permeates not only DevOps discussions, but but pretty much many of the, the discussions that I have uh, with folks doing various sorts of IT functions today. For example, um, uh, in uh, a year or so ago, I did research on integration technologies. And one of the things I found was that the workflow capabilities of the various products that companies were using uh, were as important to them as uh, the integration capabilities themselves. So I think, um, you know, Ron's emphasis on orchestration and workflow uh, really can't be emphasized enough. So to the degree that you have products in place that you can use to uh, kind of link your processes across the life cycle that uh, very often do support integrations with other tools that are performing other functions, um, to the, you know, building that end-to-end -end workflow orchestration function, I think, is the most important. You know, most companies today have multiple tools in place performing um, multiple uh, portions of, of the life cycle. What they don't have is the ability to kind of tie it all together. And in a way, that might be the hardest part, but I think that it's really important to focus on that area. And certainly that's one area where um, uh, release automation and workflow automation can help. Great. Thank you for that insight, Julie. Ron, let's jump back over to you. This question is, does Atomic support Oracle CRM applications? Um, yes, thank you. I, I, I alluded to that a little bit in the, in the presentation itself. We, we do, we support, we have a, a full-blown integration into uh, both Cibo. We're also working with a lot of the uh, e-business suite and, and other Oracle applications. We're a certified partner with Oracle. Um, short answer is yes. Great. And let's take one more question, Ron. It is, we are considering a microservices architecture rewrite for one of our big applications. Do you have any experience this year regarding Docker and deployment processes? Yes, a so great question. And, and Docker, clearly, you know, the star of, the star of, I'd say, probably 2014 uh, and, and into 2015. Um, so a lot of it, and CoreOS being, being a close a close second there as far as, as what we're seeing. Um, 
so the, the interesting thing about containerizing applications is that um, the architecture of the application becomes external. So what we see with uh, some of our customers that are already um, orchestrating Docker uh, and Docker environments are two main use cases, two main um, uh, points regarding deployment that, that become very relevant. Um, first is pushing a change is, is easy with the containers themselves, but updating the live application um, remains many times challenging from the perspective that uh, tear down and tear up are not always practical. Um, um, a good example would be a point of system, a point of sale system that we've seen where, you know, setting up an entire uh, virtual office, so to speak, has dependencies across containers and then uh, for that particular customer, tearing down the entire virtual office means tearing down a whole bunch of different types of containers and starting them up has, uh, surprise, uh, surprise, surprise, orchestration challenges. So we build an integration into that and we orchestrate it in a, in a, in a very uh, similar fashion. I, to the question, if you're embarking on this, I, I would say uh, pay attention to uh, the architecture and, um, and find the constraints uh, early in the process so that you can um, make sure to embed this, this orchestration um, early on. And, and don't hit the wall when you're when you're already uh, falling into it. Great, thank you, Ron, and thank you, Julie, for taking those questions. And I wanted to thank our audience for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Enterprise Management Associates tomorrow, and it will include the on-demand playback, a PDF of the speaker slides, and some additional resources. So I encourage you to log that out check that out, rather. Thanks again for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day.